Thank you. All right. My name is Liz Gerard. I'm the Director of Advancement for Compass Housing Alliance, uh, and I am honored today to um, help facilitate uh, and moderate this um, wonderful event. Uh, Navigates is a speaker and conversation series that's designed to bring our community together to learn, collaborate, and foster understanding about um, the complex intersecting issues underlying homelessness and the housing affordability crisis and what we can do about it. So welcome to you. Uh, I see staff members, I see board members, ambassador council members, um, supporters, and also members of the community at large. Um, so great to see uh, your faces um, and have some time with you tonight. Uh, we hope that you find tonight's presentation um, really helpful um, and informative and inspirational. Uh, I would like to introduce you to Josephine Ensign. Josephine is a professor of nursing at University of Washington School of Nursing in Seattle, uh, where she teaches health policy, public health, and health humanities. She's an adjunct professor at UW School of Arts and Sciences, Department of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies. Um, and she earned her doctorate in public health from Johns Hopkins University. Um, she's also worked as a family nurse practitioner for the past 36 years, providing primary health care to homeless adolescents, families, and adults. Josephine is the author of three books. The third of which we'll be hearing more about tonight, which is called Skid Road on the Frontier of Health and Homelessness in an American City. She'll be sharing from her book and we'll be discussing what the history of homelessness in Seattle can teach us about our current situation uh, and promising solutions. Josephine has prepared a short presentation to share with you uh, and then we'll turn it to you, our audience, for questions and conversation. Feel free to add your questions in the chat as we go and we'll have time at the end of Josephine's presentation to talk together. Uh, so Josephine, take it away. Thank you, Liz and Anne and Nathan, all the fine folks at Compass Housing Alliance. And also wanna thank everyone for being here this evening um, and applaud the opportunities that we have as a community to kind of further um, our conversations um, about the, the issues around homelessness in our community. So you can see this okay? Yes? Okay. So um, yes, lessons um, from our past uh, in terms of informing our future. And of course the uh, photograph on the left is from um, is uh, the kind of Hooverville, we had many Hoovervilles, but one of the largest and longest lasting Hoovervilles in the country, which was in Seattle during the depression. So shout out to all of these um, organizations and then also especially to Lorraine McConaughey, McConaughey um, who is a beloved public historian in our area and has been a great mentor for me um, throughout this project. So what I wanna point out tonight and, and also um, direct you to some of the other resources is that Skid Road is uh, a larger public, what would I call public scholarship project. Um, and it includes the book um, that came out from uh, Johns Hopkins Press this past summer, but it also includes a growing collection of digital storytelling videos on different aspects of the history tied to current events and current situations of homelessness in Seattle and King County. And in particular, that ties in with the two people's stories that I want to talk about this evening. Um, the first one is commitment, and that is about the story of Seattle's and King County's first official homeless person, Edward Moore, and also the history of mental illness and uh, lack of coordinated treatment in our state and in our region. And the other one is honor their stories. And that is really a reflective piece that both of these are only five minutes each. And it's a reflective piece about my experience researching and writing about the story of Kikasomlo, um, uh, Princess um, Angeline, who um, was Chief Seattle's daughter. And um, where I acknowledge, obviously, I'm 
not obviously. I acknowledge that I'm not Native American and, um, and you know, the, the different ethics involved in all of that. And I also wanna give a nod to the fine um, historians that have gone before me. I'm not a historian by training, um, but this uh, Skid Road was, uh, is a history of homelessness and healthcare in, in Seattle. And of course, uh, Maury Morgan's um, Skid Road. And also one that I drew on a lot is Call Thrush's Native Seattle. So the situation of homelessness in Seattle and King County in this photograph I took in 2015, it was right before or uh, right after, right around the time that um, Seattle and King County um, declared homelessness uh, an, an emergency, a crisis. And, um, and to remind us and to remind me to, to um, to give a nod to the fact that since the beginning of the kind of settler colonialism founding of King County and Seattle, we've had one of our country's highest rates of homelessness. Um, so this isn't something all of a sudden brand new. There are many reasons that go into this, but it's not something that is totally new. I also always like to talk about the fact that homelessness is considered a wicked problem. And that's not a moral kind of a designation, um, but it's more to refer to terms, especially in urban planning um, and social, social policy kinds of things for issues that are so cross-cutting, interconnected, gnarly, nobody can um, agree on the causes for it, much less the solutions. And, um, and so homelessness obviously is a prime example of, um, of a wicked problem. So is our healthcare system, <laughs> by the way. So this, um, uh, we have not had an official point in time count, um, count us in, in Seattle and King County um, since the pandemic um, hit. This is from the one that, that was done the January 2020, right before um, COVID hit our area, our country, and um, and this just to point out the um, the HUD definition of chronically homeless because you hear a lot about chronically homeless um, people that we um, work with encounter um, in our day to day lives who are living living rough, living homeless on our streets and our parks, um, living in their in their um, vehicles and trucks. Um, uh, in, in most cases, not all, but in most cases are within this definition of chronically homeless. So it, it refers to both the length of time homeless, but also the fact that the individual or the head of the household has a diagnosable illness, either mental, physical, um, behavioral health illness or um, a physical um, disability. And this is from the King County Regional Homelessness Authority um, website. If you don't know about them, I hope you um, soon do know about them. And this is showing um, from uh, people who were in the system, uh, homelessness response system um, as of the end of 2021 and their reported uh, race and ethnicity and pointing out the disproportionality um, for black people as well as for Native Americans. Do wanna point out that this is, you know, for people that were kind of a point in time in the homeless response system. Um, and many of, the, of the, the, the research studies that have been done in our area have shown that Native Americans are about nine times as likely um, to, be, to be homeless as, non-Indigenous um, people, and there's a reason for that. So the first story I wanna tell you is about Edward Moore, and he is, um, um, from what I can tell from research, um, King County and Seattle's first official um, homeless pauper. Do you wanna uh, point out that Native Americans at the time um, were not considered um, citizens? And so they did not qualify as being, um, you know, even uh, able to have care from King County and Seattle. And this is a photograph from um, 
Commercial Street, which is which is First Street now in Seattle in 1865, looking north, and you can see kind of up on the hill is the Washington Territorial uh, Territorial um, uh, University, which has become University of Washington. On the left is Seattle's first hospital that was run by Doc Maynard and his wife, arguably the first nurse in Seattle, um, Catherine Maynard, and their house is on the right. So um, this gives a kind of an outline of what we know about Edward Moore. Um, he was found half frozen on a Seattle um, uh, beach um, in Belltown, what's now the Belltown area. He's a 32 year old sailor from Worcester County, Massachusetts. He was taken in um, and first of all, had his frozen toes amputated with an ax by by Doc Maynard, was cared for by Doc Maynard and his wife, um, transferred to Steelacombe under the care of Dr. Matthew Burns. And King County officials sent a bill of over $1,600 to the Washington Territorial Legislature for the, his, you know, to be reimbursed for his care. They um, declined in, in their response back. They said, even though it touches on the finer feelings, that to set a precedence for this would basically bankrupt the um, emerging uh, territorial um, uh, of Washington. So Dr. Burns, since he wasn't getting paid, uh, put him in a canoe and shipped him back to Seattle in time for the Battle of Seattle. That could not have helped any kind of situation in terms of mental illness. And, um, and then in that, that summer, June 7th, King County officials auctioned off Edward Moore. And a lot of people are very surprised by this, but this was in keeping with what was being done, not just in Washington territory, but throughout our country and, um, and in England um, and uh, Scotland. It was called the trade in lunacy um, and contract system where the government officials auctioned off and contracted out the care of paupers and ill people um, to the lowest bidder. <laughs> Um, so you can tell that the care for them was not always of good quality. And then um, evidently either nobody uh, had an appropriate bid or um, something else happened, but the town's folks took together, took up a um, contribution, bought, him, bought Edward Moore a new set of clothes, paid a ship's captain to ship him back to Boston. And then, um, he um, went back to his family, just a, a little nod to what was going on at, you know, at the same time um, as the, the care for Edward Moore in Seattle and King County, um, Dorothea Dix, a nurse and a mental health reformer. She actually uh, did a tour of the West Coast of California, then um, Oregon and Washington Territory to look at our prisons, our jails, as well as our uh, mental health um, uh, mental health hospitals. And she was a very fierce uh, advocate against the trade in lunacy, including in Washington territory. And she introduced and fought for the 10 million acre bill, which would have been federal support for mental health treatment. Um, it passed uh, in the US um, Congress, but was vetoed by President Franklin Pierce, one of our first, one of our worst U.S. presidents. So these are some um, interesting reports that I came across in my in my research that helped me understand a little bit more about what was going on in terms of mental health treatment at that time, and also Edward Moore's story. And of course, Western State Hospital was our first um, official kind of mental um, public mental um, health hospital in Steelacum and um, has had many problems as well, as, well as, um, as, as being a public benefit to us. So I also wanna give um, a little nod to the fact that um, in, um, in the research and the documents that Edward Moore was, when he was living on the beach in Belltown was being cared for after a fashion by the Native American people who were living there. And, um, and they probably helped him survive in terms of 
uh, foraging for shellfish. It was a, a big um, kind of shellfish uh, processing area for Native Americans. Um, and also point out that at the time um, that the, the, the local indigenous um, communities really had a much different view of mental illness than the Western notion. It was really um, considered spirit illnesses and the treatment for it was um, incorporating the entire community in terms of support. So this is the um, Washington Territorial um, uh, Legislature, the, the original poor laws, you know, where they were making um, the family members responsible for the care of people and that if they weren't available or couldn't be found, that then it was the county that became um, the caretakers. And our poor laws were, um, were developed from obviously the first 13 colonies and from the English poor laws. And also point out the fact that the English poor laws, and we see this still today in terms of criminalizing homelessness and having poverty be a sin um, uh, and against the law, basically, that this um, did come from the original English poor laws. So um, most, of the, most of the official histories of Seattle, including Murray Morgan's um, Skid Road, um, uh, kind of concluded that nobody knew what happened to Edward Moore after we shipped him out. But I was able to find, and this was through a, a librarian, I love librarians, if any of you are librarians or love a librarian, it was a librarian um, who got in touch with me, a librarian from the Worcester County uh, Public Library who found his uh, death notice. And so it uh, appears that Edward Moore did make his way back to his family. He was living um, with his mother and father and sister in Ashburnham in Worcester County. And um, he died uh, by suicide, by hanging, and the cause was insanity. So this, um, just to point out kind of contemporary issues, I mean, obviously in Washington State, again, we have one of our nation's worst, um, uh, um, worst mental illness um, problems, as well as one of the, um, the worst um, kind of access to quality um, mental health treatment. And a lot of uh, programs that are being done to try and address this, this was a really great uh, expose that was done by the Seattle Times a couple of years ago on um, the fact that our state, like through Apple Health, um, Medicaid, that we were contracting for uh, private, non private for-profit hospitals, mental health treatment um, hospitals to take care of patients. And this basically is, again, an extension of the trade in lunacy, which is rife with um, a possibility for abuse. Um, some of the things that have started to happen, which I think are really exciting, um, more money coming in from the state legislature, um, from different kinds of efforts, including the 2020 Proposition 1, the bond measure to increase funding for an expansion of behavioral health, especially um, at our, um, our main hospital, public hospital here, um, Harborview um, Medical Center and uh, also expanding the preparation of uh, mental health workforce, including many of my students who are, are becoming mental health nurses and mental um, psychiatric um, mental health uh, nurse practitioners. So turning to the second story that I want to talk about um, and looking at indigenous homelessness in Seattle, and this is a juxtaposition of a couple of public art um, pieces from Pioneer Square, highlighting um, the fact, you know, the, the fact that uh, homelessness is such a huge issue, especially for our indigenous um, um, uh, people. This is, these are photographs of postcards of Princess Angeline um, Kikasomo, daughter of uh, Chief of Seattle. In her later years, um, Ed, uh, Edward Curtis um, began photographing her. It was like, she was the first photograph of his vanishing kind of race um, series of photographs of different uh, Native Americans across our country. 
Um, she did um, ask for a dollar per sitting, um, but started to ask for a dollar per sitting to get her photograph taken. However, her image was reproduced, you know, um, and she, uh, on all sorts of things, postcards downtown, um, you know, coffee sets, tea sets, all sorts of things. Um, and they also um, kind of publicized her as the last Indian in Seattle. So we don't know exactly when she was born, but most um, historians think it was around 1820. Um, we do know she was born in what's now Rainier Beach. And she was married off by Chief Seattle against her will um, to a Calchon man who um, was an alcoholic and also um, uh, physically abused her. Um, there's a story in the Duwamish oral histories that I found of her escaping with her two, um, her two small children, two small daughters in a canoe and getting herself back to Seattle. And, um, and then um, her oldest daughter, Betsy, who was married likely at age 16 to a white settler, may or may not have been a state legislate, legislator, Joe Foster. He also, um, uh, abused her, um, kind of, you know, the intergenerational and the, especially how um, women were treated and indigenous women in particular. Um, she had an infant, Joe Foster Jr., and she sent a letter to her mother, um, Kikasomlo, to ask her to come help. And by the time Kikasomlo got there, she had hung herself um, and died. Um, Kikasomlo worked as a laundress for Catherine Maynard uh, at the hospital, um, also for Catherine Blaine, um, who was our Seattle's first um, school teacher and the wife of um, David Blaine, Reverend David Blaine, the first um, minister, Methodist minister in Seattle. And, um, and we know that Kikasumlo lived in a shack in uh, Belltown, Pike Place Market area, um, in an area that was actually called Shacktown. And it's interesting to look at the history of that shack town. It was home for a lot of indigenous um, people, also recent immigrants, and also um, people who, um, because of their race and ethnicity, were legally not allowed to live in other, other places of Seattle. And hopefully you know about the whole history of uh, exclusionary, racial exclusionary um, uh, housing practices. And then um, the city of Seattle and also King County um, started paying for her grocery bills. Um, downtown, they only amounted to about $3 a month. And they tried to get her to go to a hospital. She called it a skookum, uh, which is like a ghost house. She said, you know, people die there. I don't want to go there. And her grandson, uh, Joe Foster Jr., took care of her in her shack and she died of tuberculosis. And this is a photograph. If you haven't visited it, it if you're in Seattle, I recommend um, Lakeview um, Cemetery. And this is her gravestone. She was buried in a canoe, um, which is what she told Catherine Maynard she wanted to have done. And this shows the area, both where Edward Moore was found, obviously a little bit later, this is in 1882. And also you can see the whole kind of shack town area um, behind this and showing um, Native American um, uh, indigenous uh, uh, canoes and people. And again, kind of the shack town area of what's now Belltown. I love this photograph of, <laughs> of Kikasomo, um, uh, their stories of her, um, uh, for instance, when she had, when she was able to get groceries at like one of the, the grocery stores downtown and she would take her cane and she'd knock it on the wooden floor if they were trying to give her uh, inferior cuts of meat. Um, yeah, she was pretty, pretty gutsy. And this is a photograph of her outside of her um, one room. I think it was um, six foot by seven foot uh, one room and in the far right over here, if you can see the, the gentleman, uh, most historians think that that was her grandson, Joe Foster Jr. And another photograph of her. 
in front of her shack with um, one of her dogs. She had um, very beloved dogs. So kind of linking that with uh, current um, uh, kind of urban um, uh, homelessness and indigenous homelessness in Seattle King County, just to give a shout out to um, Chief uh, Seattle Club. And in the left-hand photograph, I took that in 2016 at the public library when we had a whole series, they had a whole series on homelessness. And that's Colleen Eckehawk, who was then the executive director of Chief Seattle Club. And on the right is a kind of a montage of, um, of clinics, uh, what we call teeth and toes clinics. Um, at the Chief Seattle Club. And these have been led, which I think is great, um, have been led by indigenous dental students as well as indigenous nursing and medical students. And this is a recent photograph of their new um, uh, 80 person, 80 unit housing unit um, called All All, means home that's right next to um, Chief Seattle Club in Pioneer Square. And they have more projects like in Lake City, North Seattle campus and a senior housing coming up in Fremont. And they have had Eagle Village, um, which is modular housing in Soto. Um, and they also did really amazing work early in the pandemic to especially um, protect their elders. Um, uh, and to get them into um, housing that was that was safe for them. And um, this is a photograph. These are two of my colleagues from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. And this one is to uh, kind of remind me, to remind all of us that um, you know, one of the things that I see as a real important move, not just you now, you know, Chief Seattle Club um, now being led by Derek Belgard, who is not only indigenous, but is also has the lived experience of homelessness. And that is um, the move to have more people who have the lived experience of homelessness, not only being at the table, um, but actually leading <laughs> the efforts and leading the programs. Because I think that that's really where um, we're gonna be making um, significant um, progress. And of course, um, Mark Dons, um, who is the, the head of um, the King County Homelessness Regional Authority also is very open about his own experience, lived experience with homelessness and with mental illness. And I'll end on that one. I do wanna just, um, so I don't miss this point, you can see on the sign, um, you know, where are the houseless and, um, and while, I applaud and I understand the effort to start using houseless instead of homeless. I think it really misses the point because um, for me, and I, I also have a lived experience of homelessness a long time ago when I was a young adult, um, have a lot of um, obviously uh, privileges that many other people don't, but it's not just about having a safe, affordable, um, uh, place to stay, which is important, but it's also all of the affiliations, the community supports, the, you know, family, you know, whether it's a chosen family or your real family supports that happen. And I want to quote, um, and this is the last part to open it up to questions. And this is from a, a friend of mine, call him a friend, a colleague, writing colleague, Manny Lowley, who is um, Dene Navajo. And he says that his mother always tells him, having a home stabilizes you, a home grounds you, and that's how you build a life. So I think that that is something that's a basic human right. Um, I do think uh, efforts to address chronic homelessness are important, um, but having um, the lived experience of homelessness as a young adult, having worked with a lot of homeless um, uh, teens and young adults, I think that it really behooves us to do even more um, upstream prevention to address um, early childhood traumas that we know lead to contribute to mental illness, substance use, as well as homelessness. And I don't think we do enough of that in terms of prevention. It's not politically savvy, it's not sexy, um, but it's super important. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Josephine. Um, now we're going to, in just a minute, we're going to open up um, the floor to hear your responses and questions and thoughts on what you just heard. Uh, we really value an open dialogue, so feel, uh, please feel free to share your perspectives and questions. Um, I did miss one thing in my introduction. Uh, while it was our goal to have this presentation closed caption, we did have a technical issue at the beginning, which is why you do not see captioning. Uh, so sorry for the impact this may have had on any of you. Um, and I hope that the recording will provide, um, will be helpful to you once it's released. Um, and that will be next week. I'll share more about that at the end. Um, to ask a question, feel free to use the raise your hand button, which is there at the bottom in um, the reactions uh, button there on the bottom of your screen. Um, or of course you can um, speak up or use the chat. Um, I did wanna ask a question, um, Josephine, to you to, to get us started. Um, you, uh, you practice in the here and now as a medical professional and as an academic, you've written this book, you've shared um, some of your stories with us uh, from the book, you go really deep into history um, throughout the book. Um, tell us a little bit about how um, this journey back into our history has perhaps changed your mind or informed um, your perspective going forward. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I started, this research because I, um, I'm a transplant. I'm from the East Coast. I'm from um, the South and from Baltimore. Um, right before I moved to Seattle, that was in 1994. So I've been here a while, but wanting to understand more of the history, like how did we get here? And, um, uh, you know, here a really progressive city, which is also, you know, partly what drew me here then as a, as a single, um, single mother. And, um, but also this like really, you know, gnarly and growing issue of homelessness. How, how can, how can this be? And I know all about sicko. <laughs> I know, well, you know, read that book, um, you know, the whole kind of argument that it's because we're so progressive, which I do not agree with. Um, but wanting to know more and wanting to know more about the kind of safety net healthcare um, in our area and hard review, which I um, especially I, I hold in such high esteem. Um, so that's what got me into researching that, and and also, um, you know, looking at Murray Morgan's um, Skid Road, which uh, I had someone from Elliott Bay Book Company hand that to me when I first moved here to learn more about our city, and of going back to that and going, well, wait a minute, why don't we, why don't we know what happened to Edward Moore? You know, it's written in, an engaging, I, mean, I like the book, it's written in an engaging kind of jokey way. Um, you know, how, how is it that we don't know what, what happened and, you know, how did we get here? So that's what really got me going on researching it. I think I was surprised um, at the fact that um, Seattle, again, since settler colonial, um, Times has had one of our nation's highest rates of homelessness, and and that's part of what I researched in the book of why that is why that's the case. Um, and at the same time, of that, yes, you know, we're progressive. I kind of you know thinking outside the box. We've had some really kind of crazy, in a good way, crazy. <laughs> I shouldn't use that word, um, that term, but but very um, very interesting um, uh, people um, like uh, Alexander De Soto, who started you know the Wayside Mission Hospital downtown, um, and so our willingness to try like novel approaches. You know, we were some of the leaders at the Housing First uh, model of care, you know, harm reduction, that type of thing. So, of really wanting to understand that. And also wanting to understand, well, why haven't we scaled up um, some of these some of these programs that we know work? And I do want to put uh, just out there, I am currently expanding my oral history interviews um, uh, for this overall project, and I'm also working on a follow up book that will focus much more on solutions, innovative solutions to homelessness in our area, because I think obviously we have a lot of problems, but we also have a lot of promising solutions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, uh, folks are asking questions in the chat. I'm happy to go to there. I see, I do see a hand up for someone who wants to speak. So uh, Megan, I see your hand up. Just applauding the 
the previous statement. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, Paul, Paul, uh, Hoko. Yeah, thanks. Um, the history's been there. You mentioned housing first, and you said there's a lot of new innovative ideas out there. And then you mentioned, I forget the gentleman's name who just came in to try to gather everything together in Seattle to, to really bring everybody together. So how are we as a community really going to tackle this problem now? Because it seems like housing first was the big thing. And everybody said, we're gonna end ha homelessness in 10 years and 10 years passed and we're worse than we were. And obviously situations happen, but history tells us we've been the highest in the area. So what do we need to do different or start thinking about collaboratively, both with the community, our government, and, and by government, I mean the state and counties around us, because you're seeing more and more of this leave King County going to Snohomish, and we've got to work together, just like all the different services work together. What do we, what do you believe we need to do different? And maybe it's an insight to your book that you want to share that's coming up. Yes, that's a, that's a complex question, um, but thank you for it. It's, it. That is what I'm, what I'm thinking about um, all the time now. And that, you know, um, obviously um, having a more robust and, and money behind it and, and, and effort behind the King County um, uh, homelessness, the, you know, the regional authority, um, I think is a good start. You know, we're already seeing the same, you know, not in my backyard and don't send, you know, the homeless, um, you know, mentally ill or substance using people to our part of King County, um, keep them in Seattle. Um, so, I mean, that kind of the infighting, the political infighting, um, I know that there are really excellent people um, who are working with those kinds of issues, like Sophia Aragon, who is a nurse, um, who's now the mayor of uh, Burien, um, worked with Burien, the city of Burien, in terms of uh, a DESC expansion of a housing first um, there as well. So I see like those, those kinds of things as positive trends, you know, of course, in our last, um, you know, just finishing the legislative session, um, a lot of emphasis on improving um, program services for especially people um, with chronic um, homelessness. Um, I worked with uh, Re uh, Representative Frank Chop on his initiative 1866 Apple Health and Homes, which did pass and is now um, also has funding and it is now on our governor's um, desk. That And that helps in terms of supportive housing for people um, experiencing chronic homelessness and across the state, um, which I think is really important. Um, we know from studies that the vast majority of people who are homeless in Seattle um, first became homeless in Seattle and King County, or at least in Washington state. Um, and if we can help people and this includes young people. And for instance, um, Away Home, which is an amazing group of people, um, Jim Theophilus got started um, across the state working with um, local communities like Yakima to um, have local solutions to like early identification, early intervention to, um, to you know, to stop um, kind of foster care kinds of things falling out as well as homelessness for young people. Um, so I find those, um, I find those at least a positive step. Um, again, I think we need more, somehow more in terms of prevention. Um, housing first, I think is important. I um, am intrigued by the movement for more social housing, which is a, a different kind of a model, um, including um, kind of self-governance um, and, you know, much more kind of equality within the housing um, so those are some of the, the efforts that I see um, as, as being promising. Thank you. Uh, um, speaking to that, where we were just talking about, Amy asks, you know, why, why do you think we have one of the highest rates of homelessness here in this area? 
Yes, so early on, um, and even Edward Moore, who was a sailor, and looking at the history of our poor laws, um, which something that I didn't know, Marie McConaughey knew because she had done a lot of research on this, but sailors um, were constri conscripted, like if they were paupers in their place of origin, like for potentially for Edward Moore, if he had been a pauper in the Boston area, he could have been brought before a court and made to become a sailor. It was hard work, it was dangerous work. Um, you know, he probably was in a shipwreck and washed up on our shores. And then um, the timber industries, early industries that we had here in our, in our area of timber shipping, um, that those were mostly um, single men, able-bodied men, um, and um, and disconnected from their families, um, and you know even internationally if they came here, but especially from other parts of our country, and so of having those kind of dis disaffiliations, and um, and then you know with the the rise of the railroads and the whole kind of western um, you know the western frontier of people moving here. Um, as kind of a land of opportunity and also almost like a last resort, um, a, a last hope kind of a thing. I mean, it, you know, literally um, was the end of the, the railroad. Um, so I think a lot of people um, uh, came here like with a, with a hope and with maybe even the promise of a job. And then the difficulties of living here, the cost of living, um, the lack of, you know, whatever kind of social supports um, ended up um, living in poverty and homelessness. And that, you know, we still see today. I've had a lot of, a lot of patients that I've worked with, including like homeless, homeless women, women living homeless, who, uh, this was pre-pandemic, had a job offer, like in our tech industry, um, and relocated here from, you know, maybe the South, um, of our country and then got here, the job fell through. They had no family or friend support and um, it ended up falling through and becoming homeless. Yeah, I know that we've, a Compass has explored the topic of, you know, the causes of homelessness by hosting Greg Colburn, a colleague of Josephine's, who's actually in our audience tonight. So mm -hmm. hi, Greg. Hi, Greg. Um, <laughs> to present uh, his, his research with his, with his colleague, um, he co co published the book with, um, on, you know, on really exploring that question really deeply. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that there's, um, some really incredible and poignant pieces of your book that really felt so prescient today that, you know, you were talking about 100, <laughs> us 150 years ago. Um, and, and Greg looks at um, the current data and, and really where we're at um, uh, against, uh, uh, compared against other cities in the nation. Um, so I recommend you all check that out if you weren't here in November to hear our interview with Greg. Um, and, and I think your work complements each other so well. So, so appreciate that you're both in our circle. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Greg. I have your book on my desk. I can't pull it out because my ring light's on it. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, great to hear you tonight. I enjoyed being yeah. here. Yeah. We did have a, a question earlier in the chat about, you know, the investment we, we are aware that our government, government has made over, you know, over many years of time. Um, and, and where, why are we still here? I think it's, it's the question, how, how, how have we, um, invested so much and, and yet we're here. And mm -hmm. so if you could speak to that, that would be helpful. Right. Well, I think again, um, uh, maybe we haven't invested in the right way. I mean that, um, I can't say I'm all, uh, super politically savvy, but, you know, having worked recently, you know, this past year with um, Representative um, Frank Chop on this 1866 um, Apple Health and Homes of, you know, of what's uh, politically expedient, you know, what can actually get through and, um, and the kind of low hanging fruit and the, the one that went across the aisle, you know, Republican and Democrat was what do we do in terms of uh, chronic homelessness? And that's also what our fe federal government um, has has also put the majority of their funding into. Um, 
which I think is important, but again, we're not looking at the pipeline um, of what's going on. I mean, evictions and the, you know, the, the pause on evictions um, during the pandemic. Um, and now with those coming off, like in our, in our city, in our state and across the country, a lot of us who've been working in homelessness for you know, 30 years, 40 years are really concerned that it's gonna just be a, a huge increase in family and individual um, homelessness again. So, um, so that I think is, is you know, like looking at the data um, and seeing what can actually really help. I mean, we know everybody's experience of homelessness is an individual kind of a thing. So even though I kind of poo-pooed or, you know, scoffed at, I think it was Colleen Echohawk's um, plan when she was running for mayor to uh, have a list of every single homeless person in Seattle by name and by, you know, what their, what their needs were, um, I, you know, I, reading more about it, you know, looking at that, I think that there's something to that of, of really having, so it's not just a number um, kind of a thing, but, you know, this is, the, this person's um, specific kinds of uh, unique um, situation and having the capacity to then try and, um, and meet those needs in a more flexible way, I think is important. Yeah. You shared earlier with us that you'd experienced homelessness when you were younger. Um, and we have a, a question in the chat um, about some of the causes of youth homelessness. Uh, did you, did, were you able to clock in your research that some of those causes changed over time um, in terms of the needs of youth and whether we're meeting them as a city or not, or as a culture, as a community. Yes, yeah, and probably one of the most emotionally difficult chapters of, of Skid Road for me to research and write is uh, Threshold, which has to do with uh, a teen young adult homelessness, um, the history of it in, in Seattle. Um, and, um, and kind of tracing through the treatment of girls and women, you know, from the very, again, you know, settler colonial logging town um, and, and how uh, I think at the beginning um, of our city and town, the age of consent in Washington territory for girls was 12. Um, so <laughs> looking at that, uh, and looking at the kind of the thread of, you know, gender-based violence um, and then um, commercially sexually exploited um, children and youth um, in Seattle, which, you know, this chapter really focuses on the, the kind of the 70s and 80s um, down around Pike Place. Um, that I think it hasn't really, it hasn't really changed. Um, again, the link with with childhood um, traumas, you know, not you know bad hair day traumas, significant traumas, you know, sexual abuse, um, physical abuse, that doesn't get um, adequately um, identified and have meaningful intervention for, and we know that that um, definitely contributes to, um, mental illness, substance use and homelessness, you know, for everybody, um, but then, you know, for talking about teens and young adults, you know, reforms to our foster care system, um, reforms to our court system and even how police, you know, we're treating, um, girls and women as has come out recently in the Seattle times. Um, I don't think that that's that's changed, and also the fact that that this has always been um, an issue that where um, girls and women who are from ethnic minority, indigenous, um, black, um, and and from poverty, and also with histories of abuse, are much more likely to get caught up in commercial sexual exploitation and sex work. Um, so I think that we've made some efforts to try and start address that in public education. Um, I have really good talks a lot of times with my students, you know, about this versus, you know, sex work. Um, but I think that that, um, that is something that obviously still exists and that we need to pay more attention to. Yeah, indeed. 
Uh, Paul, you have your hand up. Sorry for that, I was on mute. Um, the second question I wanna ask, and it really comes down to where, obviously you can't solve homelessness by just increasing um, the money for um, aid to mental health. You need to do that, that's one whole point. As we heard earlier in November, another point was getting affordable housing. So has there been anything done that you've seen throughout history where we really, you know, we want to, every county seems like they want to bring in money for taxes. And so we allow developers to come in and build all these houses and expenses, but what have we done to really drive or do you, in the history of Seattle to force developers to build affordable housing in the area where they're doing that development instead of just giving points and government saying we're going to take and give you credits here and you can build that housing anywhere you want yet we're not solving that problem and the reason why i bring that up is because about mental health and everything we've seen a really good job at least i've based on what i've seen in the news about indigenous people uh, and indigenous reservations they've really started to turn the table on uh, how to help and support their own people uh, and really try to purge some of that um, abuse that was going on. And I think we've, we've heard a lot about that, but that starts to help with the mental health issue and get that out there. It's still prominent, no doubt about it. I can see it on 99 North, you know, along the strip of you know, the Lowell's area and North Seattle still, but what are we doing about taxes and are, you know, really the city trying to go after the developers to say, hey, we need you to put affordable housing where you're taking it away from, because it seems like we're overpopulating, we're building housing, but we're building a lot, you know, tearing down a little bit of housing and putting, uh, tearing down a bunch of affordable housing putting up expensive housing and only putting in a little of affordable housing. Do you see anything changing there in history? Uh, yes, you have really good questions. So, um, yeah, no, I think also, and I have, you know, some of this in, in one of the chapters of my book on, on Yeswa Terrace, you know, our, our country's first um, uh, racially integrated public housing right next to um, Harvey Medical Center and the whole redevelopment of that into mixed income housing, which has displaced um, people um, uh, from that area. Um, I think that that um, is a really good question. I know a lot of people are working um, on that. Um, the, and this is Greg's area in terms of real estate. There, I mean, there's just like so much money involved in this and the, um, you know, the incentives to kind of have the status quo, I think are huge. Um, the, you know, people that are pushing for more social housing, that's really trying to address um, some of those issues so that it really is like long-term, you know, it's not uh, kind of a, a rent thing that goes back to, um, a developer, um, and so I think that there, there are efforts to do that. Um, like throughout history, there are people, again, you know, going back to Alexander de Soto, um, you know, a physician from Spain who came here during the gold rush, and he ended up, you know, he bought a former opium smuggling steamboat and parked it, you know, in city, city, um, uh, lot kind of a thing uh, the docks downtown and opened opened a housing kind of a program as well as a hospital for people that couldn't afford it but even you know, like even that program even though it was fairly popular um it was run out because the land you know along the seattle waterfront became too expensive and so the city kind of um uh, closed that down so that, that's a really good question. Um, I'm doing more research on it. I'm reading Greg's book 
and Greg has a comment about, oh, Greg, why don't you just come off and say it off, off mute and say it. Oh, thanks, Josephine. I, I guess my, my response to the question would be, um, I think if we're going to look at private developers and say, why aren't they building affordable housing? Uh, I would just say because that's not what they do. And we can have a separate discussion of whether that's good or bad, but that's just the reality of a, of a market-based, capitalist-based uh, system. They, they, they have money and they build things and they need to make a profit doing so. And so um, I, I, I don't go after developers and say, shame on you, because ultimately that's not what they do, just as Apple doesn't, doesn't make iPhones and lose money, right? They, they do that to make money. And so ultimately, my belief is that there has to be a greater role up, up by the government in the provision of affordable housing. And if we put our heads in the sand and say, why aren't developers doing this? We'll continue to, on the same road that we've been on for a long time. And, and that, that government involvement can take a variety of shapes and, and certainly nonprofit actors can play a really important role in, in philanthropy and all sorts of things. But um, you know, in our history, the, the, the greatest um, provision of, of affordable housing has been directly from the government through the public housing program, which was created during the Great Depression. And, and in the 1970s, we said, we're going to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. We started to create vouchers, and then we allowed the private market to kind of take over the housing system. And now we have a very small sliver of, of support for low-income households and housing. And, and so it's, it's kind of this tragic but pretty conceivable outcome, given, given the way that we've structured our, our housing market. Right. Yeah. That's one person's opinion. <laughs> Definitely uh, a disinvestment in housing from the federal level. And then also like going back to Dorothea Dix with the miss, miss, missed opportunity that we had to have a federal um, support for mental health um, uh, is, is, is really um, a shame. I think we would be in a much different place now. All right, one last question for you, and I'm gonna do my wrap up and send you all off to okay. enjoy your evening. Um, so after you know this conversation, having done so much work in your life and written your book, what hope do you have for our city? What, what leaves you hopeful? People like all of you on here, I mean, Compass Housing Alliance, all of the, all of the you know, nonprofits, um, uh, you know, good, uh, good um, uh, kind of public people like Sophia Aragon, Burian and Representative Chop, I mean, people that have been doing this work and that um, I think understand it and that are wanting to work together to try and, um, and really improve the situation. I mean, I don't think, it, I know we're never gonna end homelessness, but we sure as heck can end the, um, you know, the just uh, deplorable um, kind of uh, conditions that we let our neighbors live in um, at this point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, please join me in giving a big thank you to Josephine. Um, so grateful to have you here, Professor. Um, if you would like to pick up uh, a copy of her book, Skid Road, we linked it in the chat, link it again. Um, and we encourage you to pick it up at a local bookstore if you can. Um, yes. Yes. Thanks to all of you, our audience members. I see staff, I see board, I see community members. It makes my heart so happy. You know, Josephine, what you said is just perfect at the end. This is why we're creating this space to learn and uh, talk and struggle with these issues ourselves. Our community matters and it's really the community um, that will have the answers um, if we choose. So uh, the recording, yeah, <laughs> the recording of this event uh, will be available on our website in the next few days, and it'll also be going out in our e-newsletter, um, which comes out once a month at the end of every month. So expect that at the end of next week. Um, we will also be announcing our second Navigates topic and speaker very soon, likely happening in June. So keep an eye out for that information as well. Um, and if you haven't signed up for our e-news yet. Uh, there's going to be a link in the chat to do that. We just need your name and email uh, and you'll be signed up. Um, and also we follow your feedback. Um, I did want to say that uh, our wonderful mission advancement officer, Ann Janetti, is the engine and the vision and the force behind this event, um, this beautiful thing uh, that we're bringing our community together to do. So Ann, I just wanted you to wave so people could see your face. Um, thank you so much for all your work on this. 
um, on this wonderful evening. Um, like I said, we value your feedback. Uh, we're also going to drop Anne Janetti's email in the chat for you uh, if you have feedback, and we'll do a second call for it there on that newsletter as well. So that's all I have for tonight. Thank you all so much for joining. Hi. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.